Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much indeed for the very warm welcome. And uh, welcome from my side. Uh, how good to have a group of people who are and have lived through the crisis here. And it's been a long crisis, actually, uh, an emerging one. It depends on how you look at crises. Crises, for me, are ones in which you are understanding a process that's unveiling. You get into the edge of that cliff, and you can make a decision. And the decision is one in which uh, you start to um, look very carefully about how to turn uh, things around, how to move towards a more city, a city that's more resilient uh, to climate change and to build in a more sustainable city. So I wish to share with you how we dodged Cape Town's day zero. And I will make a couple of remarks towards the end on how I see things unfolding here within the municipality. But essentially my job is to leave you with some thoughts, hopefully an inspired story and one of hope. And I hope most of all uh, that we will be able to leave here with a sense of we are moving in the right direction uh, from what I can see. And I think that's an important uh, to hold on to as we um, are really at this stage beheld or beholden to how nature unfolds. Uh, if it rains, it's going to be uh, a one which we can dodge as Cape Town did as well. I've been interviewed by lots of people um, uh, over the news media as was uh, in, introduced to me just now and uh, quite regularly being called up on radio programs internationally as well, and I'll share some of that just now. One of the people that amused me most in the interviewing was uh, Lester Kivett from uh, ENCA. And I got to know Lester quite well, and it seemed like uh, whenever you needed to fill airspace, uh, he would phone me. <laughs> and Lester, when we first met, it was um, just after um, the cycle tour was being remanaged at Cape Town because the, there was great concern about how water was going to be dispensed at the uh, cycle tour. I didn't know any of this and he trapped me with a couple of questions about how I, I thought we should be managing the cycle tour and he'd been talking about this all day I think on the radio and gave me this kind of question then but Nevertheless, he began by saying to me before we even got onto air, he said, um, I've just spoken about three weeks ago to a fellow called Jan Brunt, and he was from the fire station. And now I'm talking to Dr. Winter. What can you do with your name? And I'm really interested in how names work out here. And the funny thing was that soon after I've spoken to a lot of public um, engagements, it's rained. And I remember being at UCT with medical school, for instance, and as I got out the actual venue, it was raining. And when I arrived uh, on a, an occasion earlier on this week uh, to go to Rhodes University, where I had a, a, a workshop uh, this last week, um, Thursday, it rained. It rained like anything. And I'm going to bring you a little bit of rain on Sunday and on Tuesday as well. So the more you invite me up here, the more chances that the winter is going to bring the rain. And I, I got familiarly known at, at, in Cape Town as Dr. Water. So it's really about the lessons, learning from these lessons of the crisis that I want to chat about for uh, some of this um, first at least three quarters of it, and then some uh, comparisons along the way. And I think you'll see the comparisons emerging anyway. Uh, and then we can talk in the Q&A session more about the actual crisis. So there are four things that I want to uh, bring to you as part of the story. The factors that caused the problem are almost exactly identical to the things that you're experiencing right now and have over a much longer period than what Cape Town did. Our drought was really from about 2015 uh, through to about 2018. Whereas yours has been emerging for a long time, and you look at the data in terms of your rainfall data and what's falling in the catchments most of all, uh, that's a much longer period than what we had to undergo. And the one thing about Cape Town is that they market themselves really well. So we've only seen you coming onto the radar quite late in the day, whereas Cape Town knows how to market things in a different way. So how do we escape it, obviously, is the key point that I'm making in the talk. What's the future hold? And then is there a silver lining for this municipality and your lives here? 
when the crisis emerged, particularly in January 2018, and I thought I'd for the alumni here to just remind you of the steps of UCT uh, and bring you back home a little bit here, um, but I was heading up the water task team in the University of Cape Town, and the reason why I say this is partly because, or bring this, is part of the story is because the university is really a microcosm of Cape Town. Uh, we struggled to find where our meters were. We struggled to get maps that gave us a good idea about where the pipelines were in terms of the reticulation system, both in terms of water and of sewerage. Uh, we were doing that for the bigger picture in Cape Town as well. We were struggling to find out whether the water the bills that we've been paid, the utility bills, to the, the city of Cape Town were actually on UCT's property. Uh, and, and there was plenty of talk with the possibility that we were paying for a neighbor's uh, water that they were using and UCT didn't know that. We were struggling to understand how to change the behavior of the residents in particular uh, living at, in, the, in the university. And those are all the microcosm. But the story I really want to say in here is that the vice chancellor and the executive asked me to come and speak and give a short 10 minute presentation to the executive. And I gave them an overview of what was happening, and then I said to, uh, finished my talk, and maybe I wowed them, but there was a silence for a little while, and the one person that asked the most, most important question, and I remember this really vis vividly, it was the Vice Chancellor who said, Kevin, if you were a betting man, what's the chances that our institution is going to close this year as a result of the water crisis? And I hesitated for a moment, I have to say, uh, because I knew exactly he asked the right question. And uh, he was the only one who asked that question around risk. And I said to him, there is no chance that the city of Cape Town is going to endure a day zero. And I walked and left that meeting thinking, I just hope I won't eat my words. I was reasonably afraid with what was going on in the city in terms of been on the Section 80 committee, and I'll explain a bit more about that just now, and what it did. And it's a committee that I'm really hoping as one of the lessons that this municipality may or may not be doing, it's possible, and I know we've got some water engineers among us over here, but that was an invaluable uh, committee that just shared information. It was not a decision-making body, but we can see some of the things that we contributed there helped to shift thinking as we progressed through the drought. So that was the VC, smart man, uh, Dr. Max Price uh, at the time, and asked the right question. And we walked away relieved, thinking, I wonder what we should be doing here as an institution, knowing that we're gonna get through this day zero, uh, but we also need to make sure that we are compliant with the demands of the city of Cape Town. And we then instituted a program to save 55% of the water across this, the university alone. The UCT is one of the 10th highest users of water in the city of Cape Town. So clearly it was a target uh, and we needed to do something about it. And among other things of what we did was, where's that water going to? If you can't measure something, you can't manage it. So we started to put in about 70 different electronic meters all around the city, around the university, particularly in the residences. And so at any one moment, I can now go and look at what is going on in a particular resident. And in particular, I was looking at what happens at midnight. Because at midnight, when hopefully students are asleep, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be using water. And we could then pinpoint the particular residence that was starting to leak water. Now there's a lesson that I think is for all cities right now, is do you know where your water's going? Data is incredibly important. And you've got to value that data and analyze that data and then try and find out how to deal with it. So the factors leading up to the crisis. Well, here's a quick uh, video, which I think should give you a snapshot in three minutes. Earlier this year, the water crisis in Cape Town, South Africa was at the forefront of international news but the timeline of this crisis extends years back and is still going on today. A 1990 headline in the Cape Times said the city would run out of water in 17 years, based on a Water Research Commission study at the time. 
Though Cape Town has been experiencing a devastating drought, the exponential population growth played a huge role leading up to the water crisis. From 1995 to 2018, Cape Town's population grew by 79%, massively increasing the demand for water while the supply was running low. 2007, the Department of Water and Sanitation issued a warning about potential shortages for the city's water supply. In 2014, the city's dams were at 71.9% capacity, but in just one year, it had declined to nearly 50%. Two years later, in 2016, the city decided to implement level two water restrictions, and it was quickly elevated to level three on November 1st, 2016. This meant that no sprinklers or hoses could be used in residential areas, but the threat was still looming. Cape Town began to plan for emergency water sources, beginning the construction of three major desalinization plants. By the end of the dry season in May 2017, the storage and dams were less than 10% of their usable capacity, and it was announced that Cape Town was in its worst drought since 1933. On June 1st of 2017, level four water restrictions were put in place, limiting the usage of water to 100 liters per person per day. In just three months, the city imposed level five water restrictions. This meant that starting September 3rd, 2017, each household could only use 50 liters of municipal water per day. And to put this in perspective, the average American's eight minute shower uses 65.1 liters of water. By New Year's Eve of 2018, level six water restrictions have been implemented. And just a few weeks later, day zero was announced. Projected to take place on April 21st, 2018, this would be the day that municipal water supplies would largely be shut off and residents would have to rely on 140 water collection points around the city to collect a daily water ration of 25 liters per person per day. In February, a scary turn of events changed the date of day zero from April 21st to April 16th. The reality of day zero caused Cape Tonians to significantly reduce their water use. And by March, the total daily consumption for the city was down to 511 million liters per day. And Cape Town had hit its rainy season. Day zero was then moved to May 11th, then June 4th, and then to July 9th. And finally, on June 28th, day zero was postponed indefinitely. Although Cape Town has slowly come out of their drought and successfully reduced their water consumption, they're not out of it yet. They have continued to remain in level six water restrictions to prevent slipping into another crisis. And today, day zero stands at an unnamed date in 2019. So it gives a bit of an impression of uh, what happened and I think you can see very strong similarities in this metro as well. On the 18th of January, um, the mayor of the city of Cape Town, Patricia de Lille, announced uh, what became a media frenzy thereafter, uh, that Cape Town was going to experience a day zero in 90 days time. And it was interesting for me, who positioned myself uh, in a, this particular uh, area of research, uh, the, and, and invited uh, the media and worked very hard at the communications uh, each day. In fact, when I got to my work each morning, uh, early, early morning, uh, I had so many emails to actually answer, and I found the easiest way to do that, and they came from all over the world. It seemed like people were interested in failure. They weren't necessarily interested in how you're going to pull your way out of it, but we're quite uh, position the cameras and everything on, on sites where failure looked like it was going to be. So I often get asked the question, where can we best represent in our photographs and our movies where failure is being shown? And uh, they camped literally outside, uh, almost outside my office to some extent, and I found uh, certainly clever ways, I suppose, to handle emails, large with voice uh, messages, uh, which managed to get through some of these questions quite quickly. Um, but all over the world, it's surprising the interest uh, that was gathered uh, out of all of that. And I guess that's partly because of Cape Town's profile and so on. But it was an area of real frenzy. On the 18th of January, which was a Thursday, uh, by the end of that weekend, large stores right around Cape Town, uh, all of the water bottles uh, with, with fresh water in them were uh, removed off the shelves. People bought and even fought for them. 
And it's amazing that this, how our psychology kicks in, that fear uh, drives people to do things. And uh, that announcement from the mayor changed everything. And you could not go to a conversation like this, for instance, without having to uh, meals like this or, or any kind of uh, event, without water becoming so conscious in part of everyone's discussion. Uh, and you couldn't turn this way or that way without seeing a sign, a something which told us uh, that we were in a crisis, that this drought was serious. In droughts I've seen in other parts of the world, and this is particularly from the Australians, and so a brief graphic to try and show you. It looks like a bit of a speed bump, but this is what it kind of looks like. First authorities deny that uh, there is a crisis, and then you get to a period of long procrastination. Yeah, it's gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. Cape Town's exactly the same. And then who do we blame? Okay, we know who we're gonna blame. We're gonna blame political parties, and uh, somehow we've got this crazy thing in this country whereas technical staff members who are carrying the responsibility are being told how to operate by politicians who know nothing about water management, for instance. Crazy we're doing this. Why are we being putting ourselves under such pressure as citizens in this country? And to people who are there for five years. And so every time we get a new budget and a new things emerging each time with a five-year uh, election periods. Strange the way we're operating, and I wonder whether that is the best model that we should be looking for. And eventually, after all that blame, particularly in Australian uh, models, is uh, the implementation. And the implementation brings more reluctant acceptance because, because you've got to pay for it. Uh, someone's got to pay, and it's costly to do the kind of things. If you talk about desalination, for instance, which people are saying is the answer to the way we're gonna keep our cities running, uh, those are coastal cities, it does require an enormous amount of resources uh, at this stage. And I'll come to that maybe a little bit later. And then finally, a reluctant acceptance, I suppose, that leads into adaptation. And I think we're gonna to have to learn uh, not only to ad adapt, but to mitigate more. And mitigate in terms of m measuring or, or measured approach to how we live with this changing environment that we are living in. So think about this, and uh, the little video clip I showed you just now, uh, this is a story that I, uh, I, I gave to an audience uh, in a conference, um, and I had a fellow called Chip Snadden, who I was known to me as a, uh, a university much the same time as I was, and he's a graphic artist. And as I told the story, he drew this on the board, uh, almost uh, as you see it in front of you over here, with amazing graphics. And it depicts a water manager uh, in the city of Cape Town who has endured uh, a journey with a little bit of bumps and also a bit of meandering and winding in the road. And as he's gone along that road, he's recognized how comfortable things have been ultimately along that road. He's navigated it. Uh, he's looking in the rear view mirror and uh, been somewhat comforted by what he sees in that rear view mirror. Taking his eyes off the road, and in doing so has swayed onto the wrong side of the road. And suddenly over the top of the hill comes a juggernaut with its lights on and the hooters blaring. And uh, there's 90, in this case 90 days, but let's call it 90 meters to be able to shift out the way. And you've got to do that really quickly. It's a crisis which suddenly has appeared and you've got to react very fast. In 2014, a bumper year for the city of Cape Town, they won uh, the C40 International Award for the best managed city in terms of its water in the world. So 40 cities involved in that. So great accolades for that. And the city of Cape Town certainly made that known uh, in its publications. But it also rained in 2014. And at that stage, the citizens of Cape Town were using 1.2 billion liters of water every day in that city, like there was no tomorrow. In fact, 237 liters per person per day uh, is the, what we were using. That's huge. The average of the world is around about 120 to 160 at the most. So that's the envelope. So why are we as Cape Tonians way over the envelope? What's going on there? Are we losing water? Is there unaccounted water? Or are people just using water on their large gardens? And I think the latter was probably what often has been touted as being a, an issue. How do you get from 1.2 billion right down to our model, which said we've got to get you down to 450 million liters per, per uh, a day in the city. 
how do you do that? You're actually having a, a jump of almost two-thirds in order to meet the model to avoid the crisis. Well, there are lots of multiple challenges in all of our cities, and this perfect storm that's brewing, and it depends on how you look at storms. So the personalities probably here who will say, storms make me fearful. I am risk-averse. I don't like to face these as opportunities. And the other personalities would say, this is an opportunity. And one of my concluding remarks at the end to give it to you right now is, out of crises come amazing opportunities. And that's where some of the silver lining lies for this municipality and you as citizens living here. But here are some of them, and they're exactly the same as what you've seen here. That water demand exceeds supply, that surface water is exploited to the full, that there's a high cost of energy and limited capacity of that energy, and energy is required to drive pumps and to keep pump systems running. The discussion between ESCOM and the municipality for me is, has not reached a sufficient head. You should not be going through a crisis right now and having to negotiate your way through ESCOM. Those who are water engineers here will know how serious it is, it is when there's no energy on your pumps. That has serious implications for the movement of sewage in particular. There's rapid population growth, there's urbanization taking place, there's land and limited space for development, and there's a reactive spatial planning, rapid urbanization, I said just now, an overloaded utility, services and maintenance backlogs. I know, as in the city of Cape Town, the people in the technical services are overwhelmed. They're equally overwhelmed here. It's quite clear from looking at the statistics that I've seen in terms of just dealing with water leaks alone. How do you face 3,300 leaks all over the city and probably a whole lot more that no one knows about? Those are the reported leaks. But there are two areas that I do uh, have also from an environmental science perspective, it's one of my disciplines, uh, and that is the collapse of ecosystem services. In other words, water quality is another really big challenge uh, that has to be faced. And that's where some of the silver lining might lie for you as well, as it is for the city of Cape Town as well. Our bigger issues in this country are about urban poverty. And I often get asked, so what's the biggest environmental problem? And I do something that's different in terms of my answer. I'm saying the biggest environmental problem for us is, and challenge, maybe see it as a challenge rather than a problem, is in our terms, of, in terms of an urban context, is urban poverty and inequality. And you start, I won't unwrap that for you at this stage and unpack it further for you, but if you start to think about that logically and where some of the issues are arising, particularly in terms of access to resources, uh, to livelihoods, to uh, health services and other services that are critical, uh, inequality um, and, and poverty that's linked to all of that is a crucial challenge and we have to find better ways to deal with that. And water runs through all of that, by the way, and maybe I'll illustrate that a bit later. Very similar to yours as well. This is our drought periods, 1920s, 1970s, and what you've seen there is annual runoff. And rainfall is one thing, annual run runoff is probably something you need to look at much more carefully than just rainfall. Uh, it's the runoff into the catchments because we're so reliant on surface water. And you can see the last five years over here, there's a circle of what we went into from about 2015, we started to see our rainfall drop. And by the end of 2015, we had less than 60% at, in November. So now we're going into our summer months and it doesn't rain until we get to around about April, maybe if we're lucky, but certainly June and July and we got down to the lowest levels of recorded rainfall um, in, on, on record, and a one in 320 year drought a potential that occurred there. So is it climate change or it's mismanagement? And it's never one or the other. There are multiple layers here. So don't get fooled that this is all about governance and misgovernance, etc. Don't think it's also about climate change. We tend to use these as scapegoats. There's a lot of layers in between. I can't talk about all of those. But just a quick map over here, if you can see it where you are, it's probably quite difficult and more detailed there. But all our water comes from a catchment which is outside the city boundaries. And they're lying in areas of nature reserves. So there's high quality water and it's gravity fed into the city. So we've got massive advantages compared to what you have here. You need pumps and pipes and a whole lot of things to move water. If you could move that Neutgedacht project faster without pumps and just gravity feed it, we wouldn't be here today. I'm pretty sure that we would have uh, water, although that's water that comes from a long way, just as ours does from outside the city. 
94% of our water all comes from a dam. And that says to you already, if you're in a climate change scenario and if you're in an area where it's growing urbanization, uh, and you saw in that early on that uh, our city has, has literally almost trebled in the, since 1996. Um, so huge urbanization occurring there, as is the city as well. So here's another quick story. Uh, um, one which was a delightful exercise. I'd never been on a, a helicopter before, I don't think. Um, but I was invited by a dignitary uh, to fly from the, the airport in Cape Town, the helipad, uh, to the Teovatis Kloof Dam. And as we flew over the city, uh, we met with a group of people from the city of Cape Town. Um, Peter Flower, uh, second on the right there, uh, headed up the uh, executive in the water and sanitation program. The man with a pink shirt in the middle, who often had his arms folded, is Mike Bloomberg probably one of the um, most well-known people in, uh, in, in Bloomberg's uh, media, for instance, but also a three times mayor of New York City, and by the way, probably one of the 10th most wealthiest people in the world. And Mike Bloomberg came here as an envoy for the United Nations Climate Action, Climate Change and Climate Action, and he particularly was interested in uh, what we were doing about it in terms of action. And he thought this was a good way to profile what is happening to cities that are enduring climate change. Um, and as I flew over the city, I suddenly took this photograph and it's stuck in my head ever since. But it speaks to me of a city that is unsustainable. It is rapidly moving up the West Coast corridor. Uh, and as you do that, you put in more pipes, you put in more pumps, you put in more energy, you put in more roads. And they're single story houses. Uh, we've got the strange notion that we have to have a house with a, a yard and as big a yard as we possibly can. And we pay for that very dearly because we are now 40 kilometers from the city as we fly over here. It's going to cost you 40 rand to just get into the city, particularly if you take a taxi right now. And for many people, you live in 40 square meter homes, in RDP homes. And we will regret where we put them and how people are having to survive in all of that. And I'll come back to that story later, uh, just now. As we got into Teobatis Cliff Dam, they were scurrying around, not as you are doing here, putting floats on the dam to try and ex extract the water, but to build a weir so that the wellhead, the pump, that is pumping water out of this Teobatis Kloof Dam uh, was able to at least get some water into it. And they were rapidly trying to do that at the time that we flew over. And that's what it looked like. Uh, this dam that uh, no more than uh, three years before was absolutely full and overflowing to a point at which it was, looked like a beach. And one of the things the city was doing, in fact, uh, through the National Department of Water and Sanitation, who owned the water, who owned the dam, were pumping that water into the Burgrava Dam. Why were they doing that? Because, well, Teovatis Cliff's a big dam. It's a big water surface area. It's a shallow dam. So what you want to try and do is pump as much water out of that into a dam that is deep, has a smaller surface area, reducing the evaporation rate, and you hold that there. And so when I said to the vice chancellor, there's no chance that we're going to run out of water, the Burg River Dam was holding about a month and a half to two months of water sitting there. And if we made it through to the end of April, we knew we had another, perhaps another three months to go before that water was finally drained. And I don't think the city was perhaps honest enough in saying it's there, but the moment you start holding out hope like that and saying, oh, it's okay, we've got the Burg River Dam, I don't think we would have got the same response to the media as, and behavior, ultimately, uh, that we would have got there. Mike Bloomberg says a couple of things in the book that he and Carl Pope wrote. Uh, Carl Pope is the ex-director, uh, former director of the Sierra Club. And uh, the two of them wrote a book with different chapters saying different things. But uh, I focus particularly on Mike's comments here. Cities are the key to saving the planet. And the reason why he said that is that as mayor, they recognized that a million people were going to be moving in to New York City by 2030. How do you embrace that one million people? How do you see that as an opportunity rather than a problem? And if you start to think that way, our cities are going to grow. We're only 63% urbanized across South Africa. 
our cities are going to grow enormously. For us in Cape Town, it will be 70% urbanized uh, in that region um, by 2030. So very soon, in fact, all cities will be very similar to that, particularly metro cities. So cities are the key to saving the planet. I won't unpack that, but think about it. It's a, quite a controversial statement. And particularly in South Africa, where, where we have this dichotomy of rural development, putting money into rural development, or putting money and resources into cities. And there's maybe some discussion that emerges out of that later. Because most things that we do in a city, to try and improve it, to make it better, to make it cleaner, healthier, more accessible to services, economically productive, could potentially be reducing carbon emissions. And again, very controversial statements. I mean, shouldn't you be thinking about Amazon rainforest? Shouldn't you be thinking about the rainforests in Central Africa as key ways to reduce carbon emissions or at least to act as a carbon source? How do cities reduce carbon emissions ultimately? And then I put in yellow over here because I think it's a really important thing. And I'm not so sure in your own city I get this impression that you've been scared terribly uh, about what might happen. I don't know. Uh, I'll come to that just now. But we shouldn't scare citizens, as Cape Town did, about the future. We should rather show in the immediate benefits of taking action. We should be showing the immediate benefits of taking action. How prevalent is that? Maybe that discussion comes up a bit later as well. So how do we avoid day zero? Just as you're doing right now. And I've seen changes in the municipality's website. Uh, I haven't looked frequently, but certainly over the last few weeks, I have seen an emerging information here, which I want to give credit to the municipality for doing. Uh, because this is exactly what we did. And I argued as an academic that information and data was really important. And you need to take the public into your confidence and to share that information. It is vital to build trust. You cannot get public to respond because of the acute messages that you put on posts, etc., uh, on whatever it is, social media, whatever you're doing. Uh, but when you start to show every week, in this case, every Monday at 2 o'clock, the journalists did the work for us. So the data was put up there, and you could see exactly where it was. And this continues, by the way, so this is the 27th of June, 2022, and that's what you can see where we are right now, prior to our winter rains. We had a little bit of rainfall, but not very much. And so, is it climate change that's driving us? How can we enter the winter rainfall pattern with such a lot of water still in our dams? It's not about climate change or weather variability so much, but it's about better management and about a much better understanding of the water demand. And so we moved into the first part of our rainfall with probably about 68% of our water sitting there uh, prior to the winter. We've been right through the summer rainfall or summer lack of rainfall, put it that way. And so there's a difference there. And you can see the weekly change. You can see what other major dams are doing. You can see that we don't have any desalination plants operating at the moment. The ones that were installed from that little movie you saw just now were there as a temporary exercise. And the city learned an enormous amount about how to procure um, infrastructure like desalination during a crisis. And the statement that came out over and over again in our discussions with the city you cannot build your way out of a crisis. Once you're in a water crisis, that is, once you're in that crisis, there's very little you can do about it. Uh, what you can do is appeal to the public, as a comment made earlier on. You can manage the pressure a lot better. You can deal with the unaccounted for water, the water loss. And you can also improve your management of data that you're getting in there. But don't try and start building new things and finding you scrambling because inevitably there are consequences that come out of that and you regret that uh, at this stage. Now, clearly there are projects in the city that are close to being finished. I'm aware of that. And those need to finish and they've been ongoing for a long time. And uh, particularly the Nordgedacht and one's hoping that that's going to be uh, in place quite soon. You can see what we did in terms of water and I just 
give you that briefly. This is the dam storage, the monitoring and reporting, which is very important for us over here. This is millions of liters of water in the vertical scale. I always have to take my students through very carefully. When you see a graph, make sure you know what the vertical scale and the horizontal axes are saying, and look at the units. Uh, so the million liters of water per day, uh, and you can see in 2014, in the, about the second line coming, uh, the column coming down there, is where we're using 1.2 billion liters of water per day. And we went right down to around about 450 in the end, or 500, somewhere there, as about the best we can do. I think it was 478 million liters of, of water per day. That took a lot of work to do that. And after that media conversation from the mayor, within three weeks, we had dropped from 780 million liters of water per day down to about 550 liters, million liters of water per day. That media message scared people no end, and the reaction was dramatic. And we always ask the question, if the mayor had not said that in the way that she had and the media taking them up, would we have been able to have got people down to a level? In other words, did scaring really work? It did, it had a, the right reaction, but could we have done it another way? And who knows, hindsight's 2020, isn't it? Another really good model, and I'd really like to see this on the municipal website, is it gave us a very good idea of tracking what was happening. So in the black line with the black little dots there, you can see what happens to our dams on a weekly basis and where we're at right now. So there it is dropping right down over there just prior to the winter in May. And then suddenly we've had a bit of rain, so things have started to uh, uptake a little bit there. The blue line above that is what we would expect to see uh, where our water levels are. So we're slightly below the projection, uh, and we'll get back up there as soon as winter rain starts to occur. And during the winter time, people don't use as much water. But it says three things here which are really important. One is, What's that emergency response look like? What's the risk? What's the critical zone? And where's the danger zone? And let's be aware of where those are. And those become part of the conversation of how you market, as it were, uh, the, the information. Useful one. I won't uh, go through this graph. There's too much, too little time to do that. This is in the airport. Uh, you could not, from landing in a plane, first of all, the pilot told you, that you were going into a drought-stricken area and you need to behave. When you walked through what felt like sometimes a corridor of shame, you saw the bottles hanging from the lines over here. You saw notices. You could not turn anywhere in the bathrooms in the uh, airport without seeing some reflection on this. I've flown twice in the last five days into uh, Chief David Stearman. I don't know what's going on there, apart from when I'm standing around, do I hear something of a commentary on the, uh, over the intercom? And then an apologetic net letter, or note rather, uh, in the bathrooms which says, um, um, we're sorry for the inconvenience that we're using non-potable water in the bathroom, which is a good thing, but you're not aware of the fact that there's a bigger picture emerging. When I land in here, I want to know that this is an area where I need to be much more careful with my water. So take a leaf out of that and someone please take that back to the municipality because there's another area that is unticked in terms of consciousness. Thank you. You can't build your way out of a dark drought. So. This is a message from Cape Town's bucket bearing bodybuilders. The late night leak reporters and repairers. The water saving succulent specialists our pressure management magicians, the water-wise schoolyard vigilantes, and the Cape's compulsive consumption calculators. It was tough, but together we refused to waste water. Now we're the number one water-saving city in the world. Come and see for yourself. It might just change the way you think about water. The city of Cape Town, making progress possible together. And of course the point is, you can't build your way out of a drought, but you can rely on people. And that's really the message from that. Very clever little advert at the end over there, uh, when we'd really almost finished the whole uh, day zero scenario in somewhere around about August uh, 20, uh, September rather, 2018. So from crisis comes new opportunities. 
and I'm aware I'm moving on with my time here. So uh, this is the really interesting opportunity that emerged out of it, out of this discussion. Came for me the first time our shared water strategy. We had not had an urban water strategy before. And this urban water strategy uh, is bringing together a little bit of Mother Earth and apple pie at this stage, but essentially some principles and commitments that the city is working towards. And it's starting to be translated in various ways. So here's one of them. I spoke early on about the fact that I was on a Section 80 committee in which we dealt with water supply. And we now focus in on a, another new uh, Section 80 water committee. Because I said many times in the water quality meeting, in the water supply meeting, I should say, in the water supply meeting, that I'm much more concerned about water quality than I am about supply. Supply can be managed technically much easier than water quality. And water quality, both groundwater and surface water quality, is the big challenge that faces us here in South Africa. And it's harder to crack as the nut than it is to try and bring more water in. And there are technological solutions, and of course there are social and economic solutions to water supply as well, which must be factored into it, but it's much, much harder to deal with water quality. And so here's a, a group of people who, in, I'm somewhere included there, uh, I was absent in the day, and they're standing next to a lake that's given us a great deal of problems in the city of Cape Town with failed water, wastewater treatment works. On the left-hand side, far left-hand side, is Mike Webster, who's the executive director of Water and Sanitation. Uh, the guy in the back, and I'll come back to him a little bit just now, the tall man in the back there is the mayor, uh, who's right behind water quality. And then a group of specialists who are academics, who are consultants, engineers, and so on, uh, and social scientists who are involved in this water quality committee. How does that translate? And here is of an in area of interest, and a mayor that is young, and you can see by the complexion of his skin, we, we never gave him much due. We didn't think that he'd be able to operate in a situ situation like this. But somehow he's cutting through this through incredible hard work. And the councillors who are working with him, he often asks them the question, thanks for your report, but how can you do better? When we see him in the streets at a grassroots level interacting with people, there's a breath of fresh air that's blowing through uh, the city. And he's, you can see it in the way these councillors are operating around him. Now, I don't want to blow him up too much in terms of exaggerating and bet my bottom dollar that he might fail somewhere along the line. He's bound to do that. Uh, politicians uh, have a short life, I think, in some ways. Uh, but there's a remarkable change uh, in terms of focusing on the water. And he has five key things that he's trying to achieve in his five-year period. One of those is about water quality and building a water sensitive and water resilient city. And so I took him on a paddle. I've never had a mayor out on a paddle with me before. I regularly do a paddle from Musenberg, those who know Cape Town, or most of you do, uh, from Musenberg to Milliton, and we go through the canals and we literally paddle through some of the worst parts of Cape Town to try and highlight the water quality. We've done that for the last 12 years and I've never really had much support from the councillors and from the mayor in particular. But I took him on a short section over here. I have to say, by the way, as a bit of a uh, aside, that his, his canoe that he was in capsized. And uh, he was full of water, he was wet as anything. And just before we got around the corner, where a whole lot of media were waiting, I stopped him, I said, we need to tip this boat out and get it free of water because you don't want to be starting your period of, uh, as a mayor for the next five years on the sinking ship. You will never live that down. It's the Titanic par excellence here. And uh, he, he took that as a very good advice and tipped the water out, etc. So our shared water is a document uh, that has become a guiding document to how we're going to deal with five things in particular. And these are commitments that enables us as public to hold the city accountable. We often don't know how to hold our municipalities accountable because we don't know what they're working at. And so here are these commitments. And in particular, the water sensitive city by 2040. And when you start thinking about water sensitivity, and there are loads of things we could talk about as definition, et cetera, how and what do you mean by that? And how do you start to value water and make sure that water becomes key to your development agenda in your city? Water's life. So why are we placing water so low on our agenda? 
And translating that strategy into action now is what the mayor is trying to achieve. When we build and make water sensitive cities, we're building them to become more livable, more socially and ecologically responsive cities. We're making sure that water is accessible. We're making sure that we're addressing inequity within our city. And so the graphic doesn't nearly mean much other than there's water running through the city and valuing water and making sure that water is cycled through the city, closing the loop on the water. And we were always seeing lots of people complaining in the Cape Town in situation saying, all oh, the water's going down our rivers. We've had, just like you had it on Thursday, by the way, with water rushing down the rivers and everyone's saying, well, what's the problem? Are we in a crisis? We're losing all that water. How do you close the loop on that water cycle? So for us in the city of Cape Town, we have the largest dam right under our city. It's the largest sand dam. It is a aquifer and we've abused that aquifer. We're building on top of it, we're hardening the surfaces, we're reducing the infiltration into it and we're spoiling it with polluted water. And that's gonna be increasingly expensive. Now it's not a lot of water that can be trapped there, but it's water that you can use at the moment that you need the crisis. Like money in the bank, you can call on it. It's the saved water that can be drawn up when you need it. Large sand dam, 800 and square kilometers of that, 800 uh, square kilometers. A little bit of inspiration right now. Here's Singapore. This was once a river, a canalized river, with some very poor housing alongside that river. They blew the canal out the water, and you can see some of the steps that leads up to probably the most expensive real estate in this little area with McDonald's. And McDonald's, as they always tell you, they think that you think that they're selling hamburgers and whatever. They're actually selling real estate uh, because what they do is they plonk themselves in the most wealthiest areas and they get you to buy hamburgers to pay the rent. And there is exactly what they're doing there uh, in this particular case. But this is a beautiful garden. And you can see in the background, it comes back to my story just now about unsustainable Cape Town. That's their housing. It's high rise and really well done apartments that are sizable and so you might be on the 26th floor but you look down on this glorious garden managed by the national parks board um, in in the state of singapore they're so confident that their water can be clean so they use nature-based processes like wetlands to clean their water up and some of that water actually goes into a children's play park and to have children playing with that water all sorts of games with water it, it enhances the idea that water is life that water is fun and i value water from a very early stage and you again can't turn anywhere far away from that park and recognize that water is integral to the lives of citizens in singapore and these are again constructed wetlands that are cleaning the water this is another city and i stumbled across this one and i oft, often wondered why the municipality here in this city wasn't more vocal about what they were achieving there. In the middle of the city is a constructed wetland. Have you guessed the city? Probably not yet. Let me go a bit further. Well, I've put it in the title there. It's Mexico City. <laughs> the water runs all the way down here, a, 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 a sewage water that is, a kilometre and a half, goes down into wetlands, through some bioprocessing, bioreactors, those are in the, the technical side of things here. Out of that bioreactors, it gets polished by the uh, wetland system and it comes back into these ponds. Why would they do that? And why would they put a bench in the middle of it? Well, they're confident that that water is clean enough. And so what people do, and Mexico City gets very hot. So people come along, roll up their trousers, take off their shoes, sit there, and find that they, it gets cooled, it cools them down. And water cools down the city. It's valuing water, it's turning water into a valuable resource. Credible inspiration, small story for a city that has struggled with its water resources. This is what I'm doing uh, in Cape Town, in Franchuk. Um, there's Franchuk on that uh, gray area that you see over there. And uh, I'll point to it over here, and hopefully that comes out there. There's the Franchuk, the formal town of Franchuk. This is a large area which is informal and low cost, and urban poverty is extreme here. 95% of the people living here have no employment uh, at, at all. And I work at a little place called a water hub uh, down here, which is capturing dirty water, which is uh, 
contaminated by these settlements here. And in all of that, and there it is roughly where the circle is over there, I'm looking down from the informal settlement into the valley, and I always say that the informal settlement here has got some of the best real estate in the valley of Franchuk, beautiful area, absolutely magic. But and the dichotomies occur here in terms of rich and poor. It's a mac microcosm of South Africa. It mimics the kind of se uh, landscapes that we have of rich and poor. How do we address that? That's what I said to you early on. Inequalities and poverty can't work to each other unless we find ways to work with each other. And so there's the contaminated water coming down there. And just briefly what we're doing is we're using nature-based processes to clean that. We're using constructed wetlands. This is an, on an old wastewater treatment plant. And we've turned the drying beds into constructed wetlands. And we clean that water and remove almost 100% of the bacteria, which comes in sky high. We remove almost 90% of the nutrients, which also come in sky high. And we're now removing drugs and pharmaceuticals uh, that are in the system using biological filters. How do we do that without adding chemicals, without adding energy? and enabling a low-cost investment to take place and an operational cost as well. Key to trying to do some of these things, and we can add these, by the way, to wastewater treatment plants that are failing. And if we can manage it properly, and we've learned a little bit about how nature operates in terms of its bioprocessing uh, effects in these cells. It's not about the vegetation, by the way. It's about the microbial organisms that are doing their job. Understand nature, understand the microbiology, and you can actually learn a lot more about how nature cleans water. We need to go back to basics, particularly around water quality. So what are we learning? First of all, climate change, major disruptor. You know that. Uh, that's your experience here. It was our experience in Cape Town as well. Water demand in a crisis, key to managing that. And that's about managing human behavior. It's about education, awareness, and making sure that people are working with you. And that was uh, well said in the introduction to this earlier on. Building a water sense of city, a goal worth pursuing because it puts water center stage. And we've got to do that if we're going to survive in South Africa in a water scarce country. And then my illusion, or my, not my illusion, but my reference to the mayor. How do we find an accountable governance and how we find key indicators of that accountable governance? And how do we work with a new generation of selfless leaders? And I think we're starting to see that sea change occurring in Cape Town. And I just hope, like coming back to my eating my words with a vice chancellor, that I won't be eating my words uh, at the end of five years and five years and more. How do we do that? We need to change that. That's crucial. Governance and how it's been led is really important. So a silver lining? Well, let's see what it is. Well, first of all, we've got four things in mind here. These four things. We need to improve information systems. We need to improve management systems. Then we need to look at the whole recycling, keeping water within the city, all of those nice things that I spoke about early on. If we're gonna get more, build more dams, maybe. Look at other technologies from groundwater to stormwater, recycling to rainwater harvesting and to create incentives for those. Uh, and there are plenty of other things we can do there. Turning wastewater, for instance, into potable water or water that can be reused for other purposes. The big rub on this, by the way, is that you get maximum impact through information systems and improved management systems. Big deal. You can do lots there, and you can do that even during a crisis. Increasing cost if you're going to get to more, because that's going to hit all the ratepayers' pockets. What can you do by improving the first two lots, first of all, before trying to invest in things that may be the wrong investment and have consequences later. So prioritizing governance of water. Another silver lining here is as we look at the South African Weather Service's prognosis over the next few months for this area and for your city, uh, you might not be able to see that entirely, but for the most cases, it looks like, and SARS can be reasonably correct in all of this, not SARS, but South African Weather Services in this case, SOARS, and in this case, you can see that it's about normal rainfall. You are going to get normal rainfall. If you can survive the next three months, you're going to be okay. From October onwards, it looks like you're going to be in a slightly wetter period. I'm hoping, holding wood, touching wood right now, or rather, that that's going to be your case. I do not want to see the city get to a point of day zero. I do not want to see anyone 
stand in at those taps uh, collecting water because that's catastrophic. That is a social breakdown that you do not want to engage in. Uh, and I hope you can avoid that. But it looks good. So there's a slight silver line in there. Let's hope that the models and predictions uh, from the South African Weather Services are correct. And they usually are. The other really important thing I said earlier on, this is your website. If you've not been to it, have a look at it. It's looking good. There's some really wonderful places where that data is becoming available. Three months ago when I looked, I don't think I saw this, uh, and it's now started to build up very strongly. And the data's come in there. So congratulations to this municipality who's beginning to see the importance of sharing data. And for journalists who are here, get to it. You need to be able to get to that data and report it to help people understand and interpret what's going on there. And I have to compliment people like um, um, Ellis, uh, I forget her first name, who's written a lot, almost every second day in the Daily uh, Maverick. Estelle. Estelle Ellis, yeah. Brilliant. I mean, that's what you need. You need committed journalists like that who are faithfully telling the story as rationally as possible. Uh, that's really a, a bonus. And using this data to inform her, and clearly she's got credibility, so she's able to get more data than what is only on this website as well. So journalists were really important to us, and I think they'll be for you as well. It's not a time to panic. It's not a time to get into fearful. We need credible journalism right now and credible information. Go for it uh, if you're involved in that sector. And then here's more of the data uh, on your site. I can go onto that site on a daily basis, it looks like right now, and see where you are. Um, on Wednesday, you were sitting at roughly 11.96%, and you've now risen already, and wait until Friday, because more of that water is still coming in from the groundwater into your catchment areas. So it'll take a little while, but you could well be another percentage up there, uh, which is going to save the day. You want to do everything you can right now for, to push out that day zero. And there's are some of the lucky breaks that happen right now. It does rain in this region. And uh, you know, capture water as much as you can is the obvious answer. But hopefully our dams do as well, because not everyone has got access to JoJo tanks and can do the kind of things that you are, others might have. The fix in the leaks, that's a massive worry. So here's a photograph uh, given by someone on Saturday. Uh, these are leaks uh, just uh, near the, the um, warmer area. And uh, these leaks have been going on, I'm told, for almost two years. I reported that on the site. I got an acknowledgement that the, that the leak has been attended to. It's an official letter, electronically. And we're watching it. We're going to watch it from here on. And anyone who reports leaks needs to make sure that that is followed up. It's not good enough to get a simple report from an email and then not getting a response to it. That's where it is, by the way. So just uh, in a street here called Gamanda Street, and it may be a representative of what's there. It is reported, it's logged three times. I've reported on the leaks and on a complaints and on one other part of the site. So there's quite a lot of confusion as to where you can report the leaks, by the way. Uh, there are lots of other options for you. And I want to see that that's been attended to. Because I think when I look at the mathematics here, I can't work out how the blame, or maybe that's the wrong way to use it, how we are asking people to save water when leaks are occurring. It's psychologically counterproductive. Be aware of that, I think. And we're aware of that in Cape Town. Frustrated people, no end, when there were leaks and broken pipes. And the social media just lit up when a pipe was burst. And a day later, it was still sitting like that. So out of a crisis comes the opportunity to build a resilient and sustainable city. That should be your track record. And I'm hoping people in this room and others in the media might be able to take this further, to build a really important opportunity that comes out of this, uh, to capture that water and to reuse it for different purposes. And last of all, just to say, that's my last slide, and I have been a little bit over time here, but uh, a comprehensive in, uh, learning library came out of this. And a filmmaker interviewed almost 80 people who were directly involved in this. High quality stuff. And if you go and search on Cape Town Drought Response Learning Initiative, you will see it broken up into different categories, agriculture or whatever sect sector it is, and people speaking very eloquently uh, for, uh, about the actual drought and the experience. And there's lots of learning out of that as well. Uh, if you cherry pick it for your own interests, you'll find that very helpful as well. So thank you for listening to me. Uh, I hope you find that both an inspiration and perhaps some learning comes out of that as well. 
And we went through it, and we know your crisis, uh, and the feeling that we went through at that stage, which was probably much more ratcheted up than I think I sense it happening in the city over here. Uh, but my greatest wish for you is that you don't stand in a tap stand queue collecting water. It might be very sociable and nice to do, but you carry 25 litres and your car is another kilometre down there and you'll know what it's like to live in an informal settlement. Thank you very much.